Uh, and so I, I thank you for allowing me just to say that point. Thank you, Congresswoman, because I think our fight is a noble fight, uh, and it is not against anybody. It is for something, and okay. I'd like our friends to join us and recognize that this is not a good idea. I thank the gentleman from you. Sheila, Jan you uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, thank you very much. Hope you're able to stick around. Jan? Thank you. Um, I wanted to also make the point that there are many people who throughout their life have not been able to afford health care and so they really are in need of health care when they turn 65. I have people coming into my office every day. I bet, I bet this, or at least once a week, I bet this happens to you and to most members who say, I just hope I make it till I'm 65. Then I can have this fixed or that fixed or all these things that are really debilitating me and, and causing uh, such a loss in lifestyle um, I, and, and the possibility of good Serious health. Pain. Yeah, pain. Um, I finally am going to be able to, to, take, to take care of it. So a, a couple of things I, I want to just reiterate that I think are just such myths. One, I already said that we already means test Medicare. Number two, that raising the age of eligibility, according to, and you know, um, our, our um, Democratic leader wrote December 11th, is that today? <laughs> um, the uh, Truth About Medicare Age, she wrote uh, an excellent uh, USA Today um, article. And in it, she says, as one expert, Paul and Vanderwater of the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities has noted, raising the age, quote, would not only fail to constrain health care costs across the economy, it would increase them. And, sh and uh, our leader points out that the Kaiser Family Foundation estimates that higher state and private sector costs that result from raising the age would be twice as large as the total federal savings. So we, we aren't even doing ourselves a favor when it comes to expenditures, the cost of health care if we raise the age. It's a, as you said, it's a really bad idea. A another thing, I do think that a lot of people, um, especially younger people, do think that once you get to 65, you just get this health care benefit without re realizing that it is an insurance policy that seniors are paying dearly for. It's a good insurance policy, Medicare. Um, in fact, it is far more efficient with an overhead of about 3% compared to private insurance, which can have as much as, well, you would know better, is it reaching up into 20% overhead, overhead costs. So Medicare is, works very well, and it's popular for very good, good reasons. But as you pointed out, we can control the cost of Medicare. I'm not up here, here saying, don't do anything about Medicare. Um, we aren't going to touch Medicare. Yes, we can, as we did through Obamacare. And, and you remember this number, $716 billion. Democrats were hit over the head with that number, saying that we funneled that kind of money, we stole that money from Medicare, implying that we took it from beneficiaries. The opposite happened. We were able to create more efficiencies in Medicare, stopping our subsidies of private insurance companies, beefing up our fraud division, even though, as you pointed out, we can do better. Saved $716 billion from Medicare and improved benefits. And that was just the beginning. You know, I was here when we passed Medicare Part D. The truth is, the pharmaceutical companies, the drug companies, got language put into the bill, written into the bill, that said Medicare, unlike the Veterans Administration, shall be prohibited from negotiating for better prices with the drug companies. That costs us about $250 billion over 10 years, the fact that we cannot negotiate for lower prices with the drug companies who are making money hand over fist from Medicare Part D. And so if we were to make a change like that, as the Veterans Administration does, 
drug prices would be lower for the government and for Medicare beneficiaries as well. It would be a win-win in terms of lowering prices. Yes, the pharmaceutical companies aren't going to like it, but most countries already negotiate for lower drug prices. Why shouldn't we do the same, especially for Medicare? Well, only in a free market system. <laughs> right. <laughs> would we would, would negotiation pass a law right. to prohibit negotiating prices? Right. which I think is kind of the essence of a market system. Exactly. Uh, you raised a couple of points that I want to just use a chart to expand on. The Affordable Health Care Act, Obamacare, really significantly enhanced benefits to Medicare recipients. 65 and older, they got some really important benefits. You mentioned the drug uh, benefit, uh, benefit uh, Part D, the donut hole, is being closed, and that's worth, I think, some 50 uh, five billion dollars a year to seniors. There's other things that are in the Affordable Health Care Act that have already saved vast amounts of money to the Medicare program. For example, annual wellness visits for seniors. Why is it important? Well, you find out certain things like you got high blood pressure and you take a pill we ought to be negotiating that price, but you take a pill and suddenly you're able to reduce your blood pressure, avoid a stroke, avoid some other kind of medical incident. Uh, you may find that you have a, on a path towards diabetes or other kinds of long-term, very, very expensive illnesses. So that wellness visit becomes exceedingly important. And also some treatments are available. Here's what's happened. Because of Obamacare, the inflation rate in Medicare has dramatically reduced. Over the years, you take a look at this particular chart, and it shows beginning in 2005 and now 2012, the annual increase in cost, the inflation rate in Medicare. It, was, it peaked in 2005, and then it began to come down. But here is the Affordable Health Care Act, or Obamacare, and we have seen a decline to about 2.5% inflation, which is actually less than the general health care inflation rate in the economy. And this has occurred because of multiple factors, perhaps, and it's arguable, but we think one of the major factors is the advent of Obamacare or the Affordable Health Care Act. And the kinds of programs that are in the Affordable Health Care Act for Medicare recipients that reduce the cost of medical services. I think I, it's important to point out, too, that the full provisions of Obamacare haven't even rolled out yet, although these preventive services are in place, and look at what's already happened. Exactly, and as those other services roll out, they will affect not only the Medicare portion of the health care system, but they will also affect the general population and should because of the availability of insurance and the availability of the ability, therefore, to get to a doctor, to get the uh, continuation of care, should bring down the overall inflation rate for health care, which will dramatically affect Medicare as well. So what we are on is a track that is reducing the, what they call bending, the inflation curve. It's happening. And here's the most dramatic uh, chart that I have seen on this issue, that we are, in fact, bending the cost curve. And, perhaps even more important, senior citizens are healthier. They're healthier. They're getting better care. They're getting more care. There's a couple of other things that we really... Um, Let me just say on that point, please. though, that uh, on the cost savings, that's why when the Affordable Care Act passed, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that it saves, you know, how are we going to afford that? How are we going to pay for that? That it actually saves a trillion dollars over 20 years um, in, in cost to the government. Um, very, so very good point. Let me interrupt. Very, very good point. But they were calculating an inflation rate that continued at this level. Oh, really? They did not calculate a reduction in the inflation rate. Okay. And in the more recent uh, estimates of cost savings, they're now looking at this difference here. They're looking at a lower inflation rate. 
And this saves billions upon billions of dollars in the Medicare system. So we're seeing that. You, I don't want to let a point go by that you raised, and that is, yes, all of us Democrats were whacked over the head in the elections about the $720 billion. I was, you were, I suspect the rest of us were also. The $720 billion of savings reductions in Medicare did not come from benefits. In fact, the benefits were increased just as you said. I don't know how many times I said that over the last several months, but I'm going to say it again. It didn't come from there. It came from three areas. You said this earlier. It bears repetition. First of all, it came out of the pockets of the insurance companies that were providing the additional Medicare uh, insurance coverage. Secondly, it came out of fraud and abuse. And thirdly, it came out of payments to medical providers that were not performing good services. Specifically, one of the biggest were hospitals that had high infection rates. The Affordable Health Care Act said, we are not paying for the second admission when there is an infection acquired in the hospital. This is really good news to every Medicare beneficiary because suddenly the hospital goes, oh, you mean we're going to have to pay for the cost of a readmission because of an infection? The government's not going to pay for it anymore? Well, maybe we ought to clean up our act. Maybe we ought to have a little bit of hygiene in this hospital. And we're now seeing a significant decline in the infection rates, hospital infection rates. Not expensive for hospitals to do but extremely important for every individual that goes into a hospital, whether you are Medicare or otherwise, hospitals are paying attention now to hygiene, cleaning up, washing hands, other kinds of very simple, inexpensive things that keep people healthy and reduce the cost of Medicare and general health care. Exactly. The um, real benefit of the Affordable Care Act and its effect on Medicare and everything else is that we are making this system more efficient. The health care system in the United States of America is very inefficient. We're going to be rewarding outcomes. We're going to be rewarding value, good performance, rather than just getting a, you know, a doctor sends a bill or a hospital sends a bill, Medicare sends off a check. We're going to be uh, rewarding efficiency and good practices now in the in the health care system um, and I think that that is what everybody wants you want better results for a lower cost and that's what we're getting there are some very simple things that are that are in the Affordable Health Care Act that do reduce the cost and this is the continuity of care this is the kind of thing you're talking about it's the management of a debilitating illness, for example, diabetes. If diabetes is properly managed, the kinds of extraordinarily damaging and expensive things that occur to individuals are either delayed or not happening at all. And so management systems are put in place that dramatically reduce the overall cost. They cost a little bit up front because people are keeping in touch with the patient. Not necessarily a doctor, it may be a caseworker, keeping in touch with the patient, making sure they're taking their medications, making sure they're doing the checkups that they need on a regular basis, getting their kind of thing. Oh, no, bye, this one, how about right now? I don't know, there's a whole bunch of people in this room, of 435, they're not here today, but how many have gotten their flu shot? You want to reduce the cost of health care? Get your flu shot. I think I'll go do that tomorrow. But we I ought to do that, these so kinds. You should do I it know. Too. <laughs> I, I got to do it tomorrow. I'll get my flu shot. But these are the kind of things that reduce cost, and the Affordable Health Care Act does that, not just for seniors, but all the way down the board. Um, we'll go ahead with you. About to make a comment. Then I want to turn to some of the pernicious things that are being proposed to Medicare and to seniors. No, I, I just want to say that. Um, the, the vast majority of Americans, this is not about party. This is about people who know the realities of life. Democrats, Republicans, Independents, um, I'm sure some people that identify as Tea Party. They don't want to see this Congress cut Medicare 
Medicaid, Social Security benefits. This is overwhelming in every single poll. And it's not because people are greedy. It is because they need these bedrock programs, these treasures of our American system in order to live a decent quality of life. You know, uh, Americans um, aren't asking for, they, they're willing to work hard, pay into these programs, follow the rules, um, do everything they're supposed to do. And then when they're either disabled or they're past 65 years old, or in the case of Social Security, 67 years old, want to be able to, um, the fruits of their labor, to, to, to be there for them. And, and, and again, continuing when, it, when they get Medicare to pay dearly for, their, for those services. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's really important to, uh, to remember that. Well, I, I guess we ought to all describe all 435 of us as politicians. That's what happens when you get elected. Um, and as politicians, we often read the polls. Hmm, let's see here. 67% of Americans are opposed to increasing the age from 65 to 67. 71% of Democrats, 68% of Republicans, and 62% of Independents. That's pretty overwhelming. So just in terms, of, just to back up what you were saying a few moments ago about the American public, they viscerally, internally understand how important Medicare is. And it's not just for themselves. They, got, they have parents, many of whom are now 65 and born. My mother is 62, or 92 rather. She's 92. She's a Medicare recipient. She depends upon Medicare for her hospitalization. Fortunately, she hasn't had an incident for more than two years now. But when she did, Medicare was there to provide the necessary services for her. And so it is with all of us who have parents that are in the Medicare system. So we understand this, and we really want to make it quite clear that as Democrats, we are in synchronization with the president on this issue. He has put forward specific proposals that over time will reduce the cost of Medicare without taking away the benefits, without changing the eligibility age. However, there are proposals. I spoke earlier about one that's been put forth by the, uh, the Speaker of the House to increase the age to 67. No, that's a non-starter. I'm not going to go into all the actuarial issues, which I could easily do, about why that makes no sense at all for employers who would wind up paying more. More makes no sense at all for an individual who's going to wind up paying more. Makes no sense to the Medicaid program, which you've already talked about, and makes no sense in saving money. The total cost of the system would actually increase. The cost would be shifted, to be sure. No, not so. I guess I will do a little actuarial work here. Those people 65 to 67 years of age are more healthy than people 67 and above. So you eliminate the healthy people from the risk pool, and guess what happens to those that are left? It's more expensive per person in that smaller risk pool. So what you want to do in all insurance programs is to increase the size of the risk pool so that the cost is shared among a larger population of people. What, what this proposal does is exactly the opposite. It shrinks the risk pool, brings into that risk pool or keeps in that risk pool less healthy people, more expensive, and those who are more healthy are outside. But they are now shifted onto the new exchanges that are going to be created. So the cost in the exchange is increased. And the cost in the Medicare per person in Medicare is increased. And so what's going on here? You've got to think this through. Bad idea, bad concept. Can I, can I just say one Please. thing, though? Your 92-year-old mother, when she goes into the hospital, if she didn't have, she probably does, have a supplemental insurance policy, the um, first day in the hospital, the co-payment, which some seniors have to pay out of pocket, is well over $1,000. Um, and, and so these, these out-of-pocket costs, and Medicare, let's remember, does not cover most um, vision and, and, and hearing or dental. 
And so, um, you know, se seniors still are left with not only their, their premiums and their co-payments and their deductibles, but lots of things that still aren't covered by Medicare. The cost of health care to seniors today, this is no entitlement, um, making it sound like they're getting a freebie here, is very, very expensive. We want to make Medicare better. We want to make it efficient and actually enhance some of those benefits. But the word entitlement is really misused for both Social Security and Medicare. It, it basically, it, it, the word means that when you reach a certain age, the program is available to you. It's not a freebie. For men and women in America, even those who are 65 and over who work, they continue to pay what amounts to a health care premium. It's the payroll tax. They're paying that from the first paycheck they get until the last one that they receive. And then, when they're no longer working, as you so correctly stated, Medicare is not, does not cover the total cost. So they're going to continue to pay. They're probably going to be paying for a supplemental program, uh, a supplemental insurance program, and they're certainly going to be paying out of pocket and the like. A couple of other things that have been proposed, and I want to just cover those because they're very important. It's been proposed that the Medicare system, the cost of the Medicare system can be reduced by giving every senior a voucher or a different word, but of exactly the same thing, premium support, which basically says that the Medicare system as we have known it for nearly 50 years is terminated, gone, and seniors, 65 or 67 if they get their way, would be thrown into the private health insurance market. I cannot imagine a worse situation for a senior. The private health insurance market is not interested in caring for oh. seniors. They That's don't why we have people. Medicare. They get sick. They're expensive. They want Medicare. But yet the voucher program is the privatization of Medicare. It is nothing else than that. It's the termination of this guarantee. And a senior has to go out and negotiate on their own for a health insurance policy. Good luck, Mom. You're 92 years old. Good luck getting a health insurance policy from any private health insurance company. It won't happen. It won't happen. And so for those proposals, they are wrongheaded, they are cruel, they are expensive to the individual, and they ultimately will lead to a system in which the health insurance will not be available to seniors. That's a proposal that has been given life and was actually passed the House of Representatives. It's part of the Ryan budget and part of... Uh, Indeed it is. You know. It has passed the House of Representatives twice. Not once, but twice. So this is not just some idea floating in the ethereal. This is a real proposal that is sitting in the Senate. Fortunately, it's going nowhere there. But these kinds of programs are there. The other program, and we've talked around this issue, and that is just a flat-out assault on the benefits. We're going to cut out drugs. We're going to cut out one or another of the benefits that are in Medicare. And the package of benefits in Medicare is designed to provide a continuity of care so that something that is common is going to get covered. Hospitalization, doctor's care, and now with the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, annual visits to the doctors. Very, very important. Let me be clear that as Democrats, we understand the necessity of reducing the cost of Medicare. We understand that, and in fact, we have done it. The Democrats have done it. Right. We have taken action to reduce the cost of Medicare and simultaneously maintain the benefits and improve the benefits to seniors. That is what we wa have done and will continue to do it. Things that I talked about at the very outset are very real. We can take additional steps. We can do more. The president has proposed it. And the Democrats stand ready today to take up those issues and pass them out of the House, give them to the Senate, and say, we can do more to reduce the cost of Medicare. And simultaneously, 
maintain quality care for seniors and the benefits that they have spent their lifetime paying for, paying for those benefits. We can do it. We can We've done do it. it. And I, I, I hope that uh, everyone will stand with our president who has said that we're not going to raise the age of Medicare and that the Republicans now first have to agree that we're going to ask the wealthiest people in our country to pay a bit more and not to begin with the least able to pay more uh, the, the poorest adults, seniors and persons with disabilities. Well, our, our colleague Sheila Jackson Lee, before she left, she said she brought this issue up. On the in the House today is the tax pro program that would continue the tax reductions for the middle class. And for the first 250000 for everyone. Exactly so. All we need to do is to pass that. The other alternative, which has been proposed, is to keep the taxes low for the super wealthy and to pay for that out of the pockets of seniors. We're not going there, and we shouldn't. Jan, thank you for sharing this evening with us. Uh, this important issue. Thank you. Thank you. We yield back our time. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentlewoman have a motion? No. Oh, all right. Thank you. I move. Oh, the gentleman. Go ahead. I move that the House adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. And accordingly, the House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow for morning hour debate. So the House has gaveled out, but the Chamber returns live Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern for morning hour speeches and noon for legislative work. The Chamber is expected to debate several non-controversial bills tomorrow. And off the floor, negotiations on the fiscal cliff continue. If no agreement can be reached between Congress and the White House, those scheduled tax increases and spending cuts begin to take place in January. You can follow the House live here on C-SPAN when members return tomorrow.